Welcome to the Sports Science Dudes. I am your host, Dr. Jose Antonio, with my co-host, Dr. Tony Ricci. If you're a first-time listener, hit the subscribe button and like the show. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Rumble, and YouTube. Our special guest today is Sonia friend Yule. She is the assistant cross-country and track and field coach at Florida Atlantic University here in Boca Raton. She's been doing that since 2016. Uh, prior to FAU, she served in a similar role, similar role at Vanderbilt University from oh. 2012 to 2015. Um, for those of you in the running community, certainly you know Sonia. She's an accomplished runner. She began her collegiate running career at William & Mary, and she continues to compete to this day, in fact, competing at a very high level. In uh, March of 2021, this is really quite impressive, she set a new American record in the women's 1,500 meters in the 50 to 54 age group. With a time, get this, Tony, with a time of 441.23. So I think if you and I did a relay, Tony, we still would get our ass kicked pretty bad. Uh, yeah, I could do that on a, a, a good bicycle. <laughs> but, yeah, I think I could, I could keep up with uh, Sonia that capacity. <laughs> yeah, me on an e-bike, possibly. Um, and uh, so, okay, so in 2019, world, the World That's Masters, 45 to 49 uh, age group, she won the indoor championships. This was held in Poland. She won a gold medal in the 800, which, by the way, is a very fast race, mm -hmm. as well as a silver in the 15. Uh, professionally, she's been a member of six United States world teams and competed in the 2000 U.S. Olympic trials. She currently holds additional American records in the women's, uh, this is age 40 and above, uh, the Masters indoor mile with a time of 444. Imagine that, Tony, a mile of 444. <laughs> oh, my God. Um the Women's Masters Outdoor 1500 at 416.9 and the Women's Masters Outdoor Mile at 445.68. Um, so that's impressive. Uh, Sonia has been working in, as a personal fitness trainer down here in South Florida. Uh, she and I have known each other really for a couple decades, and we've always had talks about sports and nutrition, how it applies to distance running. And we're going to have a great conversation because we know if there's one group that seems to have, you know, not an anti-protein stance about, you know, and, but more they're so carbohydrate centric that it's it's nice that you're delivering the protein message to distance runners. So welcome to the show, Sonia. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you asking me. I'm happy to be here. Well, tell us a little bit. I mean, you have an interesting story, I think. And for those of you who don't know, my wife was a pretty good middle distance runner in college. She ran at Drake at a D1 school. And... All of her friends, and I hope I get this right, out of all of her friends who ran at Drake, only one is still running. And, and this is what's interesting is, I don't know if they get burnt out. A lot of them got injured. But one of the pieces of advice one of them gave was, if you don't want to get burnt out on running, run at a D2 or D3 school where they won't beat the hell out of you. And that seems to be sort of this common theme of, if you can survive the D1 sort of, you got to win, you got to win, you got to win. Um, there's just so many female distance runners that drop out. Why do you think that is? What, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I had a bit of a different experience because coming from William and Mary academics was um, such an emphasis, even though we were D1. And I guess I lucked out with a, a coach who knew how to balance that. Um, I didn't experience that kind of, um, cutthroat, you know, training and competition. I know what you're talking about, though. I've seen it with some of my my friends throughout the years when I was younger. It's kind of like some of those coaches, because of the pressure they're under, they feel they have to throw. It's like throwing darts at a board, you know? Yeah. You throw everything at them, and the ones that stick on, then they're okay because they can, they're the diamonds in the rough, perhaps, that can, um, they have the stability and just the ruggedness to withstand that um, mentally and physically. For myself, I didn't have to go, I didn't have to go through that. Luckily. Also, I feel like I'm, I guess rugged's an okay word to use. I'm not a, you know, I am a athletic middle distance runner. Like I never had, I never had to worry about, uh, you know, being underweight or anything like that. I've, I've come from a strong Polish stock. So I've got good bones, like literally um, excellent bone density. Um, I enjoy food, <laughs> I enjoy eating. So I remember one time my, my sophomore year, I, I was like, you know, I'm going to 
yeah, I'm going to try to get under 130 because I I'm typically happy weight around 131 to 135. I'm five seven, um, and I was like, I lighter's faster. I'm going to try to in my head at the time, you know, it, and I tried. I tried to this crazy. At that time, we didn't even have the internet, so I had to read books. You know, I was looking up stuff my sophomore year in college. I found some crazy diets like 1,000 calories a day. I lasted literally about 28 hours on that. <laughs> I said, forget it. I enjoy food way too much. I'll just have to work harder. Um, but I did, you know, I saw, of course, throughout my own career, I think that a lot of it with females in particular is number one, you've what you mentioned, which was the four years, sometimes five years of redshirted of intense pressure, pressure to perform, um, intense workouts combined with perhaps an intense academic schedule. But then if you're talking about females in particular, um, you know, a lot of us after school, at least in my time, three, four years out of school, you probably had started a family. There was a good chance you'd start a family. So perhaps that interrupted um, continuing that competitive career. I think now it's changed. I would say, I think um, I see a lot more women and even masters women my age, which I hope I played some small role in that, competing well past um, their college years or restarting, like having you know having the family, starting the career, and then we see an influx now in USA Track and Field of women in their late twenties to early thirties, and what we did to make that more friendly for them and encourage the membership and the participation, we now for masters track and field we consider masters 25 and over oh, what we, we consider masters for track and field not road racing not cross country but track and field 25 and over 25 and over and with the purpose to give them an outlet because what happens is i was wow. fortunate that when i graduated school or college i was competitive and i was fast enough that I could have a foot in the door of a sub elite, right? So I could, I picked up a, a sponsorship from ASICS, a shoe co contract and a little bit of support. And I did that for four or five years and I was fast enough to do that. But there's this, there's this um, gap, if you will, of people who are, you know, they're, they're better than the average Joe or the, the weekend warrior, but they're not quite fast enough to compete as a pro, mm -hmm. but they still love the sport. What do they do? So now we've hopefully opened that door for them. And we have great participation with that now in our master's events. It's really fun to see it. Now they, they you know, 25 year olds go, it goes 25 to 29, 30, 34. So on the rare occasion, I might get thrown into a heat with a 25 or 28 year old. They're not scored against me, you know, but, but um, I think it, I welcome them. I think it's a great option to have. Wait, if if twenty five is masters, then what would fifty five be? Well, in the Naples half marathon I ran last weekend, I was happy that there was a what they call it a grand masters category <laughs> for fifty to fifty nine, and I won three hundred bucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and then the and then the senior grand masters is sixty and over. Oh so, my god. Know, now, Sonia, Tony, you guys will appreciate this. I did a stand-up paddling race a couple weekends ago, and <laughs> you're going to laugh at the age. I actually won my age group, but you're going to laugh at the age group. It oh. was 60 to 100. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say about participation in that older age group? Okay. And it was, called, it was called the legends category. Oh, I love it. That's awesome, though. <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, yeah, oh, my wife's like, if you don't beat all these old people, I'm like, <laughs> I'm in the same category. She goes, you better beat them. You better beat them. Yeah. So uh, it. it's, it's, I've it's, never, I've never even heard of a category with a ten year gap. Never mind forty year gap. Yeah, that's that's some pressure right there for that younger age group. For <laughs> that's sure. right. That's right. I'm like, I'm I'm not going to let that 85 year old woman beat me because I mean, does. you would have some explaining to do. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> now, um, you know what's interesting about distance running, and you sort of touched on it in terms of you wanted to get below 130, and in female distance running, there is there seems to be this this notion that. In a, in a way, it's partly true. Lighter, lighter you are, the faster you are. Mm -hmm. um, but I know you, the, you're actually built much, much more muscularly than the average distance runner. And 
Is there, could that have contributed to the fact that you tend to be healthier than others where you're not really a waif at all? You actually, you know, most people would say, wow, she, you know, she's built almost like a 400, 800 runner rather than a 15 yeah. and higher. So right. what are your thoughts on that? You know, putting muscle on it. I mean, it's not like you have to put on 10 pounds of muscle. If you're a distance running, put on maybe two to five pounds of muscle. Is it, maybe will it, you know, avert injuries in the long run or contribute yeah. to musculoskeletal health? You know, what are your thoughts? A hundred percent. And a lot of this you taught me and all of, you know, we've had many conversations. And when you helped me, when I was on some of those world teams, prepare for that with nutrition and so forth much of that you taught me some, the rest, I think I just earned, uh, learned by trial and error, but, and what I've seen and experienced in all these years in the sport, but 100% an athletic, when I say athletic body, I mean, a, as you can see the muscle tone on the person, um, a strong muscular body, in my opinion, in my experience is a healthier body all the way around. So muscular skeletal, um, immune system, being able to maintain a healthy body weight, you know, um, to withstand injury or prevent injury, all those things, how could it not be healthier? You know, and I think that anybody who's been misguided or who has, um, you know, who has trouble and is challenged understanding that fact, I think that now we're more aware as coaches, as um, sports psychologists within the university systems, that we're trying to nip that in the bud before it becomes a problem. When I was going through college, it was certainly a problem. I had um, at least two women, if not more, but two that I remember specifically on my cross country team that had to end their college career early because of um, they were undernourished. I mean, one had the bones of an 85 year old woman after her test. And you could see the fine hair on the face and you, know, you she was clearly too thin. Yeah. But she ran really fast for about a year and a half. Like, you know, so that's the problem, right? Is that initially, and not so much, sometimes not even so much in the mile, like the mile, you need to be strong. I mean, the mile, right, you need right. to have a kick and be able to withstand those kind of workouts. But for sure, like 5K and up um, and cross country, yeah, to a point, if you're lighter, you will, run, you will run faster for a little while. But the main, the first thing that seems to go is that bone density. So the first thing you'll start seeing if they're undernourished, or um, we call it that red zone now, the reds, is um, uh, stress fractures, you know, stress reactions, stress fractures, they're reoccurring, they're hard to heal, then they start to get, you know, those little colds or illnesses more often than the other members of the team, things like that. So those are kind of some red flags. We've also learned as coaches um, and and training room staff now as well at the university level, at least to be more aware of their blood work. So, I mean, we never, nobody ever suggested to us when I was in college, let's get your blood work done and see where you're at. You know, now we know like we, when they come, when they come ho or home to us, when they come back to the university from being off all summer or at home all summer, one of the first things we want to do is check in with some blood work with the training room. Where's their iron? Where's the ferritin? Mm -hmm. um, glucose levels, you know, creatine, make sure they're not overtraining or under fueling, you know, things like that. So I think that now there's, there's, it's still going to be a problem because humans, human nature is what it is. But I think at least now there are more um, preemptive knowledge. There's more preemptive knowledge in place and that, coaches and training room staff, sports psychologists within the system are more aware now of the red flags and trying to get ahead of that. So, you know, so the first thing we do, like we brought you in, um, Jose, I think it was, was it two, two seasons ago, we brought you in to speak to them. First thing, like August, we start in August. First thing we started off was two meetings of a nutritionist and a sports psychologist. <clears throat> and we allowed them to ask, be able to ask questions of us after and confirm what they thought they heard. And is that what it is and supplement advice and all that. So I hope we've turned it around to the, towards the better, but it, I, I recognize it is still an issue, especially with that group. And especially with, listen, the nature of a, of a distance runner is to be a type a person, right? Like everything's in alignment, checking off those boxes, maybe a little bit OCD. And I say that with judging myself as well, um, because we're, we're taskmasters. That's what we do. And, and we're used to persevering and pushing through, so with that type of personality, no matter what the sport, 
but especially like anyone where the weight could affect the performance, I think it's a it's an area you have to be proactive with. Do um do you guys do uh DEXA scans on your runners? We do not. I don't even know if we have that technology available in our sport. I would hope we do in our sports science department, but we don't. Well, actually, I think you do. I think that the challenge is there's no one there qualified to do DEXAs. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you ever need, you know, to bring the team over, and I'd be interested just especially in the female runners. Okay. Uh, we've run, I mean, we probably have, what, 500 DEXA scans on our computer, uh, Tony? I mean, fighters. You know, we, we're well players. over just 120. I think we're about 120 fighters alone now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. I know it's helped me. With the two you've done on my on me have helped me tremendously understand what's going on with my body, with health, like all on all kind of levels, right? Because you've got the bone density, you've got um, where where are you holding on to fat? Where where is the where is the muscle um, the muscle growth? Perhaps if you've done more than one scan. So yeah, I think it's really valuable. Now, this is something Tony will find interesting delving into the psychology of winning, the psychology of performance. Um, Sonia, you're always a big fan of telling the story of Billy Mills, the 10,000 meter gold medalist. Also, Roger Bannister. I mean, you know, it's doctors and scientists, you can't run a four minute mile until you run the four minute mile. And then everyone's doing a sub four minute mile. Right. Tell us a little bit about how you view that, because I know. Billy Mills is probably one of, and it's what's interesting. A lot of people don't know the story of Billy Mills, but it's one of the more interesting sort of sports psychology stories there is. Tell us about that. Well, Billy um, was an American Indian and he um, was somebody who was kind of unknown for, for, I mean, he was a collegiate runner at the time that he started this quest to qualify for the first Olympic trials and then get to the Olympics it was 64, I believe. Yeah, I think he, yeah, 64. Um, but, you know, he wasn't some, like now you, you, we know who the top five 10K runners, for example, are in the U.S. Like we know. He was not one of those people at that time. But he had from his, from his um, cultural background of being an American Indian, he had this fantastic uh, spiritual strength. Um, of of believing in oneself and how and how you go about manifesting what you want and what your dreams are and he told the story in fact I think he told the story um, I know he wrote it in many articles but he told it to you and I personally Jose and when that one podcast we had with him he talked about how he had lost his mother early on he was quite young I don't remember the exact age but let's just say between 10 and 12 um, years of age and his father took him out to the to the riverbank um, on the reservation and he drew a circle around Billy and he said, this is your circle of strength and all your ancestors, including your mom, he said, we're, we're, we are all standing there with you. And their symbol of their tribe, I think was an eagle. Um, and so whenever Billy would do his visualization, which I'll explain in a minute, he would see an eagle soaring. You know, that was his cue into his ancestral heritage. And so, to make a long story short, Billy came from relative, you know, he was an okay collegiate runner, but still an unknown on the national and certainly the world stage. And he qualified for Olympic trials. Um, and then he, he, the whole story of him making it from the trials to the team, which as you know, in the American system, it's, I hope all systems are going that day, because if you're not top three, sorry, like <laughs> go back to the drawing board for four more years. He made the team. And again, still relatively an unknown. And the race itself, the 10,000 meter final at the Olympics, what led him to that victory, what he describes is that every day for a year, he wrote in his journal, this is before we had these online app journals and all that, this was handwritten in a journal, uh, 10,000 meter, he wrote the exact time that he wanted to, to hit for the win, for the gold, 10,000 meter gold, um, the exact time and even the last 200 meters, which I find is really interesting. His last 200 meter split, we call it a split, um, which is really your last sprint, right? Your all out sprint. He wrote to the 10th of a second what he was going to hit in that. And it was something insane, like 26.84 seconds, something like that, which is, I mean, that's darn fast. Just as an open 200, he was going to do that at the end of his 10K because he figured that's what it was going to take. 
And he even described that in this 10K race, he knew they were be, he called it a mystery man. And he wrote this out in his log, in his log. There'll be a mystery man because there's always somebody you don't know about, right? At these kind of events, somebody that just the whole aura and the energy of the event helps them propel themselves to the next unexpected level. And then he knew Ron Clark from Australia would be for sure up, up in that top pack. Yeah, because Clark was favored, wasn't he? Absolutely. He was yeah. well known and favored. And and Billy wrote that on the last lap, he said, I'm going to I'm going to soar like an eagle and come from the outside and I'm going to pass them. And my last 200 meters is going to be the 26 point whatever seconds. And when you watch, it's still available on YouTube all over the place. If you just Google Billy Mills, 10,000 meter 1964 Olympic Games, that last, I still get chills when I talk about it. That last lap went down just as he said. In fact, he stumbled. He stumbled um, coming, starting the straightaway on the last lap, starting the back stretch. He stumbled and the mystery man was a, uh, it was a German. And I guess they have the eagle in their, it's in their national emblem somehow. Yes, it is. Yeah, German yeah, had exactly. an eagle. Yep. I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he had an eagle on the back of his shoulder. And as Billy's passing him, he sees the eagle and that was just like, oh, like just, you know, this whole imagery thing he had had his whole life and his dad's words to him about his mom and his ancestry. Um, and he passed Ron Clark coming down that last 150. And then the last 50 meters, he just pulled ahead. So, and his last 200 was to the second of what he envisioned, but it was a year of every day handwriting that in his log mm -hmm. for a year. And I mean, I consider myself pretty dedicated to imagery and visualization, but I've never done that. You know, I don't know how, what, what could happen if I did that, you know? So it just gives power to the fact that, and you know, I, and I believe this, and I know people have, and actually Tony, you're the perfect person to ask about this, what your opinion is, but I've heard before, this is from some Tony Robbins um, seminars I listened to, I didn't attend personally, but that the subconscious mind does not have to believe what it's told to act on it. It just has to hear it over and over and it can act on it then because it perceives it as reality. And so that's kind of the essence of this imagery that we do as athletes and the visualization and meditation. And I've heard people say, ah, that's not, that's not really the case. You have to actually, what I've heard is it's more powerful if you're in practice and you're going through say some intervals and then you're then you're playing in your mind because now you're feeling the same discomfort and stress, physical stress that you would feel in a race. And so then your subconscious mind can better associate. Yeah. But and and I yeah, I think so you're right on there. But however, the mindset and the thinking of how you're going to respond during that time has to occur in advance, too. So there's merit in that. In better words. In the midst of, okay, so I do a lot of sprinting, not only for the purpose of trying to stay relatively fast at my age, but to put myself in severe oxygen depths. My rest interval are very, they're very limited and I'm sucking a lot of wind, right? It's very difficult just to train the response um, to, to shut down the alarm systems only during the event. In better words, the response needs to also be premeditated, pre-rehearsed. Okay so that it is more effective when it occurs at that given time. So yes, it may be best to do anything while the, the actual skill itself or the actual event is occurring. However, a perfect example would be this, Sonia. We see this, I see this in fighting all the time. Uh, an athlete has a tough round. He sits down in the corner and what's coach saying? Breathe, 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 okay? Yeah, this is the wrong time to tell him to breathe. The time to tell him to breathe was 14 weeks ago to be practiced both inside the ring or cage and outside of that ring and cage. So all of the, the constructs and how we're going to behave, think, and premeditate our thoughts in a given situation have to be first interpreted properly and designed properly in advance of the actual event and then put to work within the event itself. It's very hard. Yes, you want to challenge. You want to suck wind. You want to challenge that Billy had, but by, he wasn't, when he was writing that down, there was, there was value in that. Okay. Right. He was comforting the, the entire, the subconscious, the conscious, and here's how we will respond 
completely when that given time occurs. So it is an integration of both. I, I, I You can argue, yes, it's, it's most effective when you're in the midst of the actual skill and event. However, the strategies that you're going to use have to be practiced in advance and then integrated into the event to mitigate you know, the pain, the suck in wind, or get that, in his case, it's a 20th wind to run a, a 200 meter yeah. in 26 seconds. So, so it's a really great question. And I don't, I think it's a, you, you must do both in order to excel like you do. And most of the times athletes like you are doing it when they don't even know they're doing it anyway. Right. You're incessantly so, using imagery. hundred percent. And I, and I'm glad that's, I'm glad that's your perspective because that, that makes sense to me. And it gives me comfort because I do enjoy the meditation. I call it meditation. It's, I listen to different apps um, for athletes, you know, and I'll, when I take my dog for a walk and, mm -hmm. it, and it's a soothing kind of. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And it, it may, they maybe last 20 minutes and I don't always, I'm not always obviously then laying down and closing my eyes and all that, but I, I swear it gets absorbed because I'll hear some of them in my head, like just uh, last weekend, the couple of days before that half marathon, I raced an indoor meet with the college women up at UF at that Alachua County, they have a new indoor facility. And I raced the mile and then a few hours later, the 800. And, uh, it, you know, I'm much more vulnerable now because I'm not as fast as I was. So when I jump in these races with college women, I'm not gonna be leading the race anymore. But I happened to get in a good heat in the mile, like where I had a few women that were faster than me and then a few women that were slower mm -hmm. than me. So, what I realized with that was um, it's so important actually mentally in a competition to feel like you have the chance to win mm -hmm. yep. because I've been in plenty of meets now in my mass at my master's age, um, especially since coming back from an illness for a year where I could do nothing and coming and I've been clawing my way back and I jump in these college meets and I'm getting trashed. Like, I, you know, I'm usually up in the front and because I was running a 503 mile at the time, and now I'm running a five, I was running a 523 mile. And so 20 seconds, as you guys know, in a mile on a 200 meter track, right. it's a lot of space. It's half, it's not more than half the track. <laughs> so in my, my psyche, as I'm racing, what I've discovered is my willingness to hurt that extra 10th degree. It's hard to find when I'm mm -hmm. in the back hanging on. However, in that heat I was in last weekend, I happened to be the second heat and I was in the hunt and I was, I, I raced, you know, I'm at this age, I know how to race a mile. So I didn't overextend myself. And so now I'm, I'm catching people and I, and it ended up in a full three woman sprint between myself and two other college women for the finish. Wow. That's amazing. Now I lost out on that. I was two tenths of a second behind, but you I ran there. 15, which is the fastest I've ran since the illness. But it felt amazing because I was engaged the whole time. I didn't have time to worry about splits or pain because I was too busy trying to catch her and then make sure she didn't get past me on the turn and so on and so on and so on. So I was full on race mode. None, no other external factors were in my brain and I was just able to immerse myself in it. And that's why I love racing. But I had I can see where the psychology of that had I not been prepared um, to go in and hurt or to go in and Here's the plan. When it starts to hurt at 800, you need to press lap five and six. You know, that those are the kinds of things I think about. Right. And then also there's mantras that develop, you know, the, I have developed for myself, short three to four word phrases. And they come up, they come up when I'm hurting and it's, you think, no, I can't hear anybody else with their yelling, even though they're yelling top of their lungs. I hear that voice in my head with a mantra, you know? Exactly, so yep, yep. It, it's powerful. I think psychology in sport is so I'm really underutilized still like more people are aware of it, but I still think it's underutilized. I think it's very underutilized and not well understood for any of us yet, even those that love it and dedicate our lives to it. And the psychophysiology side that you're talking about, Tanya, just what does a thought or a cognitive process, which you're doing while running because you're thinking how you're going to run, what you're going to do. I mean, it significantly changes our physiology. And when I see significantly, it, you know, the, the significant difference is, okay, you're not going to run, um, you know, a four minute mile if you run a 520, but you're going to run five, um, you know, in, in particularly pain, pain is, 
Yeah, there are there's actual construct of pain, right? There's hydrogen ions. There's a whole bunch of things going on. But simultaneously, pain is an alarm. And if you can comfort the body, uh, the brain comforts the body that everything, listen, we've been here before. We understand what this is. Let's relax. Let's breathe fluently. Uh, you mitigate it to an extent. Absolutely. And you're able to push through that. But you said the key word, and then I'll, I'll let you continue. You had different intent, right? The intent when you saw you could keep up with those young women and you saw you could just about win, the intent changes. And intent drives physiology. How? I have no earthly idea. But I'm going <laughs> to tell you, we're going to find out one day for sure. I love that. That gives yeah. me a lot of hope. I love it. <laughs> no, no yeah, it's a living example of and you and the cues. You those cues were already developed in advance. Yes. You didn't just say yes. them that day and they work. They yes. have to have specific meaning and they have to have a specific physiological effect. It's why I tell my fighters in between rounds, you know what? Smile, right? There's a physiological response associated. I don't mean like this, but okay, <laughs> cool. Here we go again. Why? Because this is, there's a physiology associated with smiling that is far more favorable than anxiety, nerves, and worry. And so there's something to all that. And I think those advanced cues that you trained are, are outstanding. That's the whole point of psychophysiology and sports psychology. Cool. It's fascinating. I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I, I think it shouldn't be lost on the audience that that you're competing against college age women. I mean, right. that alone is absolutely amazing. And I'm always wondering when they see you, they, they obviously know you're not a college runner. I mean, you're not in college. Yeah, what do yeah. they say to you? They must be like, oh my God, here's Sonia. Uh, there's got to be some sort of reverence to you, like, because it's rare to find someone who's twice as old as college girls running as fast as college girls. I, I just, I don't, in fact, I can't think of an example. Yeah, I think. The best experience, I, I mean, I've had several kind of funny stories throughout the year. Like when I was at Vandy and I was, and I was still racing pretty fast then. Like I was like, I could hold my, I could hold my own in heat in the first heat of a college mile. Um, Cause I was still running like 445 for a mile. Right. So, um, but I, I was getting on the lot. We'd be waiting, you know, to get called to the line and uh, they would kind of eyeball me. Like they were trying to figure out what was going on. You know, like, why is my mom like in this race? <laughs> and then after you know after the race no matter how it worked out really sweet like come up to me oh, i hope you know and they're innocent in this comment but i hope i can run as fast as you when i'm as old as old yeah. as you <laughs> and i'm like oh thank you so much um and now the most recent um interaction i had was that actually the day that i raced that wreck i ran the american record for women 50 to 54 i was at, down in miami and i was racing a um and you know, it was a collegiate invitational down in Miami, March of 2021. And um, this is so interesting. A few of the women from that ran from Miami were running very fast. Uh, they were great, great mile times. Um, a couple of them had been in my Weston Junior Strider. I had started a little track club. It was for like elementary age kids when I lived in Weston. This was going way back. And a couple of them were in that group and they're like, Coach Sonia are you in this race? Oh my gosh. And I was like, yep. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. I mean, it spanned, I mean, eight, 15, 18 years, you know? Wow. Um, so it's usually one of respect and um, a little bit of confusion at first, but total respect. And, and they're very gracious. They're very sweet and gracious, but they don't give any quarter now. I got yeah, it. <laughs> if I if I want to move into lane one and and they're there, I'm gonna have to use my elbow and or wait my point <laughs> one or the other. So, and that's fine with me. I wouldn't. You wouldn't it. want it any other way, right? I yes. would not. No. <laughs> Those are great. I mean, that's 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 awesome. I mean, uh, the fact that you you you're running at such a high level for so many years. I mean, that you know, what, what's the saying? Yeah. I think it was. Uh, you'll 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 like this, uh, Tony. Uh, there's there's a certain quality about you know qu no quantity has its own quality. Yeah, I think it was Joseph Stalin that said that quantity right. has its own quality. <laughs> the fact that you've been doing it so long and so well is in and of itself actually a great accomplishment mm -hmm. because you just you just don't see that. I mean, it would be like, I guess it would be akin to in the fight sports when George Foreman made his comeback. Yeah, like, yeah, it is actually. Yeah, I have to right? appreciate that. So thank you. I have to, you know, it's. 
I am a competitor. So it's, it's the hardest thing of aging for me has been getting like, honestly, like, yeah, as women, like, right. We, you know, our, we start to get wrinkles and, you know, our bodies don't look the same. And yeah, I, I have all that aesthetic, you know, issue as well, but really for me, the worst part of his aging has been getting slower. Like I, I love to compete. So I, mm, it becomes like one of these things of how do you even judge a workout, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. So these splits last year were good, but now I'm having a harder time reaching those splits. Are, am I still or performing at the same level? Like it becomes this very interesting um, dialogue, inner dialogue with yourself of what, what is my new, where's my new bar? Where do I set the bar for myself? You know, so that becomes, and, and I've learned to manage that and I'll say, you know, having being ill for so long for that year was what I, what that gave me, it gave me back the joy of the sport itself, because you can become so attached to tangible things like times, place for, mm -hmm. for us as masters athletes, it's a record, American record, a world record, a title, you know? Um, but what that taught me, having it all taken away, what it taught me was just how much I really love the sport, being around it, coaching, um, being able to go out and just go for a run and, yeah. and be out in nature and enjoy it, you know? So that was a, a, a joy to bring it all back. And so for a while, I wasn't even feeling nerves when I started racing again, because I was so grateful to just be out there. But now all the nerves come back because, <laughs> you know, once you get to a certain point, I can't take the competitor out of me. Like I want to win, you know? So but that's good too. You're, but this is wonderful because we don't know or, or have any clue. And I understand, like, we, I have tons of injuries. We all do as we age and progress. But no one's ever told us in advance how well performance can be sustained through the lifespan. And by you setting this type of precedent, like, other young women who run are going to know this, right? And And know that, damn, you're close to where they are now. What does that mean for them in 30 years? Right. Maybe with the right nutritional practices, right sleep, right stretching, right resistance training. I mean, what are, we may be on the verge of seeing athletes like yourself have a 2% loss yeah. one, instead of this 10% decline in cardiovascular or, or, you know, 15%. And I think what's wonderful is you're you're showing that now and you didn't have you don't have the tools and resources that these young women will have when they become your age to continue to to practice at that level so this this is fantastic you're redefining human performance in this whole capacity so it's wonderful it's encouraging to me i mean you got you know really exciting to say well and just so you guys know like i can't claim it all to myself there is an entire family i mean there's an entire conglomerate of masters athletes out I'm there sure, yeah. that um i am so grateful to be a part of that and uh usa track and field world masters athletics which is all the world championships i mean if you guys if listen the world indoor championships florida was just awarded um to be the host site for that up at the alachua county the the oh. indoor track up at uf march of 2025 we will host the world masters athletics championship if you get a chance to go to Gainesville, even for a couple of days, to it's a two week competition. The listen, the 70, 75, 80 year olds that you will see and what they can do. I mean, in our own country for the US, um, there's a gentleman, Charles Alley. He runs a 60, it's like a, between a 57 and a 59.6 second, 400 meters, and he's 75 years old. Whoa. It is, it, and he looks, and he looks like a 400 meter sprinter still. Holy crap, that's awesome. Old. So, so that alone, like that whole community, um, and you know, of course I race with them as well. Like that's where the national meets are. And, and, and then I feel at home, right. I don't feel as vulnerable. Like I'm out of my league a little bit, but they give me so much joy and, and purpose to continue because there's people literally 30 years older than me still competing. Wow. And they're, and I don't mean like just jogging around the track. No, like, they're moving, right? Right. Race, hurdles, high jump. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. There's hope for us all in the 6100 <laughs> age group. You can throw the shot foot, Jose. 
<laughs> no, no, not me, Tony. <laughs> okay, okay. Hey, Joey, we'll you know what? The high jump. <laughs> Soon you, and then in the good news is in 40 years, you'll be in the 100 to 150 year old paddleboard category. Yeah, that? we're going to figure out how to live another 20 years. So, yeah. I figure, I'm going to outlast everyone, and that's the only way I'm going to win. So, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you'll be at this, the back end of that 60 to 60 that's, and up category. That's right. <laughs> um, all right, Sonia, we, we just have a few minutes left. I, I know you and I have talked about this a lot, especially going back, you know, way back when about the, the sports nutrition needs of distance runners and how, you know, it's evolved really from like 30, 40 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago till now. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? I know we have similar philosophies and, you know, what you tell your, your runners at, at FAU. Uh, tell us about that. Okay. Number one, and this, this is what you taught me and, it, and it's true. So, I mean, and I've heard it many times from other sources since then, but um, I thank you for giving me that knowledge way back. And that is nutrient timing. I think if I could name one thing that for myself has made the biggest difference in either my longevity or my performance day to day, it's nutrient timing. So making sure that um, I fuel my workouts well, you know, I, I do what's right for me for fuel. For me, that involves some form of caffeine, at least 150 to 200 calories, primarily carbohydrates, easily digestible. Um, and then, but most importantly, post workout recovery, post race recovery. Um, personally, you know, I've tried many products throughout the years. I like, um, there's a product called tailwind recovery for my Tate and vanilla. Like that's just what I like, but it, it's what you've always taught me. It's a, 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 a one to four ratio of protein to carbohydrate. So about 10 to 12 grams of protein, uh, 38 to 40 grams of carbohydrate in a powder mix, mix it with water. And I get that in within, I mean, usually I start sipping on it. Be, during the last interval, like before the last interval. So I'm already starting that recovery process. And then um, branch chain amino acids. So I take, you know, BCAAs, probably about um, uh, five to 10 grams a day, divided dose. Um, I take a, I also take a supplement. What I've learned is post illness that would benefit me no matter what, even with aging as an athlete is um, it's called mitochondrial NRG. It's, it's produced by Designs for Sport, and it's basically got like creatine, CoQ10, um, there's all kinds of uh, just um, supplement supplements in there that to support um, the breakdown, you know, of the mitochondria. Yeah, can I ask you about the creatine? Because that's the one that a lot of distance runners seem a bit wary of because they might gain a couple pounds, and it, it's a couple pounds of lean mass, but... Right. What do you tell distance owners about that? Because it's not like your goal isn't to put on five to 10 pounds of lean body mass. No, I, I just say, listen, try start low. There's a maintenance dose. You know, you don't need to do the pre the loading phase. Don't worry about that. Just I mean, it's good for your brain, as you've taught me. And we've know from research, it's good for your brain. So like in my mitochondrial NRG supplement, I think if I told you 500 milligrams, would that be too little? Or is it 500 grand? 500 milligrams. It should be well total daily dose should be five thousand milligrams or no, five it's, grams. Okay, yeah. no. it's it's yeah it's um it's half of that is what's okay. in that supplement but I take extra creatine on the workout days okay um but that's what I I say just take just take a a maintenance dose and and see how your body reacts to it and most of them don't have a problem I've had one client over the years um who said oh my god I gained five pounds and I'm like I think half of it was in her head, but maybe, I don't know, you know, she, five pounds in two weeks. I doubt it. Like, I don't think that came from the all creatine, but um, maybe some people are ultra sensitive to it, but I don't see how you can go wrong with a maintenance dose. So I still promote it. And then um, beta alanine, as you taught me well. So in season, anytime I'm doing intervals, I'm doing the beta alanine every day. Um, and that's about it. I mean, the, what you taught me about protein, I preach constantly. So here's how I, I mean, I could track it and I have before, but honestly, like I track so many other things. I just don't worry. I just, every time I put something in my mouth, I make sure there's protein present. So if I'm going to have a snack and it's a, you know, let's just say it's crackers or something. Um, I make sure there's, there's cheese there. You know, they, there's some kind of protein present at dinner typically at night, like it's a, it's a good source of protein and then a side of vegetables um, and maybe a starch, you know, rice or potatoes, depending, but 
I also have got my girls doing this from a young age as eat your protein first. Cause I want you filling on up on that before starchy carbs and other things. So I just try to make protein a priority. My goal is to get in 1.1 to 1.2 grams per body weight a day. Do I always hit that? No, but I definitely try to make 100 grams a day, my absolute minimum, mm -hmm. because I know that especially with aging as a female, that's ultra important. Yep. Um, so I tell all my, all my master's friends, anybody I train, which is most of my clients now over the age of 45, I'm like, you got to prioritize protein yeah. at, least one, at least one gram of per pound of body weight a day. Yeah. My wife, I mean, you know, Carla, she's, uh, I mean, her diet, if you look at it, it's, you could almost call it a high protein diet. She, uh, she is roughly, uh, you'll be impressed with this, Tony. She's almost at three grams per kilo wow. of, of wow. protein. Yeah. She's, uh, well, I see her eat. She's, shakes? Is she doing a lot of shakes? Or? It's yeah, a lot. Of, she is, does get a lot from shakes, but she eats, I swear to God, she probably eats a whole chicken a day or something. Yeah. <laughs> so our train no, volumes that's are what pretty, it takes. People yeah. don't realize it's hard to get in. Yeah. That it is. It is. Yep. Yeah. And the one thing too, and you pointed it out nicely, Stoney, like people, they think if they up their protein by 50 grams, there's going to be no more room in calories for carbohydrates. It's a whopping 200 calories. Yeah. You still right. can get in 2,000 yeah. grams of carbs. It's not going to impact anything just by bringing the protein to the minimum dosing it needs to be. You Absolutely. Know? I have a female client and she's not an athlete. She just, she's just a fitness client. She's in her late forties. And I really, I said the, I said, the best thing that you can do when I'm not working with you, I see her twice a week for strength training. I said, the best thing you can do is increase your protein intake. Mm -hmm. Get it, get as lean and as much of it in you as you can. This is a lady who follows things to a T and she did it. And, and within six to eight weeks, like she didn't, she did it with macros. So she, she did her mat. So her protein intake is literally like 50% of her caloric intake a day. Wow. Her body's entirely changed. Yes. Just like what you said, you always said it, Jose, you said you can put on muscle, don't lift any extra weight, just eat a copious amount of protein, lean protein. And it, I mean, she did, she's lifting with me twice a week, but we don't lift super heavy because she can't handle that. But the protein did it. It's yeah. I always tell people, you know, because we know adherence is, is difficult when you work with any client, whether they're high-end athletes or, or mid-level or recreational, it's always an issue of adherence. So when when it comes to sports nutrition, the the timing issue, I always think, okay, what's the easiest thing you could do? Hey, get that protein after you work out. You know, get a shake or something. Whatever you like to drink. I don't care. Don't be brand loyal. Just whatever you can repeat. Right. And that does help a lot of people. Yeah. They don't realize that a simple behavior repeated frequently in the yeah. long run, you know, can lead to, you know, great, you know, adaptations. Well, the, the way I got Alexa to do it, she loves strawberry milk. Okay. Hey, that promise brand is like one of the healthiest ones I could find. That's she, I won't, I can't get her to do a shake yet post after track, but she'll drink a strawberry milk. So that's what we do, there but it's the right, it's perfect. It's the one to four ratio. Yeah. That's it's got some, than I'd like some calcium, <laughs> sodium, little, it's got some electrolytes in it. You can't yeah. be. Yeah. Well, Sonia, tell, uh, we're out of time. Tell the audience if they want to reach you. I know you do some personal training, uh, where they can find you on, on social media. Okay. Uh, for coaching, for running, or for personal training, you can find my website is therunningwarrior.com. Like That's that, the easiest right place on. to get a hold of me. And if you want to message me through uh, social media, it's um, my Instagram handle is at Sonia. My name is spelled with a J, at Sonia Runs. At so, Sonia um, Runs. I'm at getting Sonia it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Sonia, you know, this has been a great conversation. I, I'm I'm hoping, you know, the lessons, the things you've learned, you know, some of the younger athletes, some of the younger runners, especially female runners, they'll take it and apply it because, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot to be learned from, you know, what you've done, you know, with your athletic career. And I think it's, I think it's amazing. So uh, absolutely. Yeah. That's my goal. I just want, you know, people like yourself and other people when I was younger helped me um, and buoyed me through my dreams and efforts. And that's all I just, my goal is to pay it forward. I love the sport. So I'm trying to do it through my sport and through fitness. And, um, yeah, it makes, it makes, it gives me a purpose. It's, it's what, it's what I think I'm here to do. So thank you so much. And, and one thing I'm, I'm sure you're very busy, but you know, one of the things we encourage here at NSU are guest lecturers and, 
If you wouldn't mind, I, I boy, I think you'd be an inspiration to a lot of my students. So I, I would love to come and I would love to sit in on one of your class, at least one of your classes. I'd like to be your. We're going to work that out. You, <laughs> you will inspire these students, and I think that's going to be really great. And we're going to plan on that. I would love to. Tony. You got it.